nice to see that many people in this talk. So I hopefully uh, think that it's not because there is no other talks going on, but you are actually interested in the sustainable part of it. Uh, building sustainable software. Why is it necessary? Why should we care? The, uh, how many of you are engineers? So majority of you are engineers. So basically, if you are building something sustainable that's going to last for the long, that means you will not have a lot of work to do. So it's always easier just to make uh, crap and you will always have uh, things to do. Uh, but there is a larger implication here. So uh, days. Like everyone tries to reduce the waste, plastic, things like that. What if we thought about the software in the same way? So if we are building the software that needs to be rebuilt every five years, three years, uh, the cycle kind of uh, speeds up, that means all of the software that's built before it is just thrown away. It's, it's like software plastic. So we are littering uh, littering all digital space uh, with the useless things that we redo all of the time. So what does sustainable mean? So I actually looked it up in the dictionary. So it's, uh, it's the thing that's able to continue over the long time. So it's a lo long-term thing. And uh, today I want actually to use an analogy to show uh, what it means to build the sustainable software and what things you have to be aware of and actually address for it to be sustainable. Uh, I'll use the analogy of actually of the city. So uh, just imagine that you're building a city. It could be from scratch, from anything. So you would be designing everything. So it will be architecture, how it's going to look like. You will have infrastructure for cars to go. You have to have the balance between the nice and the one of the important thing, you will have to extend it. That means uh, if you make a mistake in the beginning and you don't have any fallback or plan B, uh, you will have issues all of the time. So if we're looking from the developer's perspective as a green field, as a project uh, of a green field, it always, uh, if you ask someone, like, how do you imagine the idea? Uh, most probably you will see no, no bad weather. Uh, it's just kind of idealistic view. The same could be said with the software. So when you're beginning the software, so, so it's going to be the new tooling. It's going to be the best technology that we choose. It's going to be scale automatically. It's never fail. It's just going to be a self-repairing thing. But when we get to the reality, it's, it looks something like this. So it's just really kind of, it's messed up thing. You cannot extend it. And uh, it's, it's really bad. So. Uh, if we're looking at the software like this, the infrastructure looks like this. So you can actually try to find the wires which leads where, uh, but I would guess that if an electrician comes and actually needs to add additional wire, he's not going to search for, <laughs> for, for the one that fits. He'll just pull the new one. And uh, the software itself, like big monoliths that are legacy things, uh, are really kind of vacant and uh, messed up. So why I'm talking about this? Uh, so I'm working in a, pro in a company that builds projects. So we do have a lot of exposure to multiple clients. And it's, it's a very often uh, thing that they actually want to build something new that's going to be better than they already have. And uh, I've been in the, on the other side as well. And uh, it, it really kind of amazes me. Uh, so what are we missing here? 
the thing is that we, the business usually does have a pretty good understanding of what they want to build. And uh, they have like a whole roadmap. And the teams that are building the software is, I would never say that it was bad. So all of the developers, they are good developers. Uh, I've been the developer myself. Uh, I've worked with the great teams. And uh, we have really good infrastructure people that are actually supporting the systems that are running. And somehow, we still kind of, we still build that crappy software that actually uh, chases us for years. So how, 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 how do we make this go away? What do we need to do actually to make this go away? And uh, how do we build our software? So it's, it's long-term vision. So it's, it, it lasts for a long time. It can, uh, it can mutate. It can change away. The business is never going to be the same all the time. So that means it needs to be flexible. So first of all, uh, I think we should answer the question, wh why do we need that? Why do we need the state sustainability? Does it give any benefits? Maybe it's okay to build the software every three years or every five years, possibly 10 years. Maybe it's okay. Uh, so let, let's see what benefits actually it might bring. So if you're building the long, uh, long lasting thing, what, what you can gain from it? So one of the direct, direct impacts for us, it's, it's pretty simple, as engineers. Uh, if you ask engineer what he wants to work on, uh, I would guess it would be a very small percentage that will say, like, yes, I want to maintain legacy mainframe for decade. Uh, usually, they will always want to work like with the new technology, new architecture, possibly new tooling, and everything like that. Uh, but it's simply not possible because it's not there. So uh, one of the answers to this question is uh, for ourselves is actually just to be able to do new things, to be able to improve the things that we already have and kind of learn. Uh, another things that are kind of technically kind of easy to identify is ease of maintenance. Uh, I've seen systems that are actually require 24-7 monitoring on them, and they actually have full-time employees just to look at those so, and keep poking so it's running. Uh, the other part is actually ease of extension. So uh, if you already have a system, it shouldn't be nightmare or half-year uh, small task that takes half-year just to implement and, and deploy them. And that's very typical in the bank, in financial sector. If you do something, you might make it in two weeks, but the deployment's gonna take half a year. Uh, the other part is security. This is uh, often the overlooked thing. So uh, it shouldn't be just easy to just to get the data by changing URL or maybe customer ID. That's kind of old school thing. Uh, these things, that what I'm talking about is actually, this is more from engineering side. So this is how probably we can understand it very easily. But there is another side, and another side is business. So how does, how, what benefit does it bring for business? So it's, it's always uh, good to have the capability to extend your software, add additional features, and that directly, if you don't have good, good software, properly architected software, you will not be able to extend this. So it's very easy to explain for the business if you're doing some, some, some proper development that it will give business advantages. They will be quicker. So they will be able to add additional features for their clients faster. That means you get competitive advantage. You can get the feature in no time. And this is already a problem. Uh, especially in financial sector, if we take uh, all uh, startups, financial startups, which are building just on top of the existing banking systems, they are, way, they are able easier to produce 
features that are required for their clients. Uh, the other part is actually the business never stays in the same place unless you want it to stay in, this pla in the same place. Uh, it, it needs to move. So that, that needs you need to be creating new features. You need to change existing software to, uh, to be able to support the business. So these are very big things for the business perspective as well. So the question is, where do we start? What, what, what does the good software is composed of? What are we missing? Uh, most of the engineers, I'm pretty sure they're good engineers. They know what they're doing. Uh, but I guess at least part of you definitely are working with the legacy software and you would definitely say that it's not very good. So one of the main thing that I would actually say is uh, there is no one, one thing that you have to look at. You need to take a holistic approach into the software development. So there are multiple things that I will go through, uh, but if one of them is missing, you're probably not going to get the sustainable software. It will be broken in some way at some point. And uh, I'll just quickly outline the important things to look at and then we can deep dive at each of those and just see what did they bring uh, if you don't do them, what issues you get with them and then we can see what if you look at them, what benefits do you get. So one of the things that's often overlooked, I'll talk a little bit more about it, is you, you need to start thinking product, not project. So the project brings a lot of issues in its own. If you think product, that kind of opens up a lot of questions that you have to address and that are spot on on the things for the longevity. You need to understand how you structure your teams or your software development departments or, or how you're going to create that, in what structure. Is it like separate departments that you hand off or is it going to be one team? Uh, the process is also very important and the process actually says, are you building the right stuff? So there's a lot of talk on the Agile and Waterfall and everything. So this falls into that category. The, the next part is software architecture. How do you define your architecture? Is it just evolving naturally or are you actually having a roadmap for it and you have some visibility into the future. So you're able kind of to extend. Uh, the development practice is, uh, from my experience, it's, it's pretty well evolved and set up in, the, uh, in companies and the development department is, I, I would say, ahead of most of the other departments in the practice application. Uh, the other part that comes after the developing is actually deployment practices. It starts with the beginning, but if you don't have it, you might have a lot of issues. And one of the things that's often overlooked and uh, depending on architecture becomes very important is actually monitoring all your systems all the time. So first thing, stop thinking product. Stop, stop thinking, that should be a different way. Stop thinking project, start thinking product. Because this is a very important thing. And uh, a typical sample that I've observed is actually budgeting product versus product. Uh, when the budgets are created, the problem is that usually it just gives a slice of a time. And then the business just tries to squeeze everything, all of the features into that time. What, what happens if you think product, project? So usually there is a temporary owner. So it will be only the owner that's uh, maybe for that year, uh, depending on the budgeting. It could be even longer term, maybe it's two years. But the site of the whole expenditure or what they're building is just a temporary thing. 
So it could be changing from time to time. What you're building, that automatically means you are jumping from one features to another and there is no continuity. That means you cannot invest in something that's going to bring you uh, benefits into the future. Uh, there is no long-term vision. So uh, if you're budgeting for a project that's going to last three months or six months, you'll try to squeeze only the features in there. So everything else that's going to be tailored for running the system or monitoring the system, that's going to be neglected. It, usually what's missed, additional thing that is being missed is uh, running costs. So it, like from the vendor perspective, it looks very nice. So you just build the software, you just give it away, that's it. But it's always going to have running costs. So especially in these times when it's, everything is virtualized, so it's running on the AWS, Azure, you name it, even standing still, it still consumes the money. So it needs to be leveraged and the business needs to think about that before it actually starts building something. Uh, usually there is a very minimal investment into infrastructure. Uh, it starts like with a POC, just build something that works, we'll extend it later. There is no, uh, no investment in the long-term vision. And uh, building something that could be refactored or extended or rebuilt later on is, is not a primary. It's not a priority. It's not primary thing. So that kind of means that rebuilding later on or rebuilding in one year or two years when the requirements change, or maybe scalability, that's it. And automation, it's usually next time. There is not enough time just to automate the whole stuff. Uh, we'll just do it later. And of course, no strategic investment. So there is no reason actually for you to say like, let's go to microservices, build up the microservices infrastructure, uh, we'll do the orchestration. They'll say, come on, that's only four months. You're not building that. When you think about the product, so, so what, what happens if you just neglect all of those items. You just neglect uh, everything. So you get something like this in ten, five, ten years. Uh, I've seen the systems that are uh, ten years old. You, you get all of the comments inside like temporary fix for uh, and then three years later temporary my ass. It's kind of it becomes just really long thing. So what if we look at the product perspective? So it automatically gives you a long-term vision. So it needs the business to think of the owner. So they need to identify the owner. So it's always easy to have uh, a person that sees where it's going to evolve, what's going to be the next. So you can actually go and build that into the software. You can actually ask for the roadmap. You can see where it's going to go what's going to be the loads to, to be able to properly design, properly start building and invest into the pieces where you see it's going to be important. It, when looking at the product, it's, it's very simple. That is, you're buying the product, you're going to be paying some running costs. So it's going to be, uh, from my experience, we even, even the standing code, standing still code requires actually money because you need to upgrade the tooling, you need to upgrade the build scripts, you have to verify that they're still running or after half a year you'll see that the version's already changed and it's not even building. Then you can actually invest into the building pipeline. So that means uh, you can always argue that you need to have a running building pipeline, delivery pipeline, roll out the new versions. and strategic investment for the future expansion. So you can invest some of the features up front so you are able to extend the software later on. It's, it's like city expansion. So it's just growth. So your software is able to grow in the long term. The next thing is you have to structure your teams correctly. So uh, this is a very in, in enterprise, this is important thing, and it's called team silos, and everybody tries to break that up now. So it's already understood that if structuring the team separately, that's not going to bring a very good result. So uh, 
If you have departments separated like application support and application development, it, it, it becomes like we've built it, now it's your turn to run it and we don't care. Do you need any visibility? No. The other part is actually that the people that build the software and know the software best, they are kind of uh, moved away and the people that never saw it are actually running it. So that kind of becomes a big uh, discrepancy there as well. And if it's totally separated by departments, the development team actually doesn't even have the access where it's going to be rolled out. So all of the different features, the issues creep up after it needs to be deployed. And there's always something left out. So the information doesn't flow that simply uh, between the departments. You cannot make 100% 100, 100 accurate documentation. So it's always either networks are not working, security maybe have not approved, even though you didn't even know that it was supposed to be approving. And uh, a typical thing that we also see uh, in, the, in the enterprise uh, uh, companies is that the architecture team is totally separated from everything else. And they have no team, but they do have authority to tell what to do. So it kind of makes the picture kind of tells everything. So some of the people are building bridge, but the others are actually building the tunnel. So what does it give you if you keep your team together? Uh, and keep the team together, I mean that it's uh, all of the engineers that are required to build the product. They're in one team. So they do communicate without any boundaries, and they do know what they're building. So there is a way better thing. Uh, way better knowledge how people think what they're building. So infrastructure knows what's going to be there. They do know the loads, what loads is going to be. They can input on the requirements. Does it need disaster recovery? Does it need scaling? Does it need elastic scaling? Is it just going up, going down? What kind of tracing does it need? Does it need to put something in the log? What's important? So they can put the input there. The, the testers can actually work in the team at the same time when the developers are working. So the, the issues can be resolved way faster and with the same uh, understanding. Uh, one of the important things is actually that the team should be self-contained. So it has to include all of the members that are required or have the authority to make the decisions. If at least part of uh, the decision making is moved out of the team, that doesn't help. So it's, it's better to have actually to be missing some competence in the team, but have the ability to make a decision rather than move that competence out. Because it always becomes a bottleneck. Uh, the same is with the expertise in the team. It needs to build, build up with everyone that needs to be there. So if you need security guy, he needs to be in the team. He needs to be able to go through and give his knowledge to the whole team. So, so the developers actually know up front what to expect rather than just get the issues uh, when, the, when the code is rolled out. And of course, it's less communication challenges. This is pretty straightforward. If everyone is sitting in one place and communicating together, you get way more context movement around. So uh, everyone is aware what's going on. The additional thing, actually, this is what Amazon uses, actually. The teams that build it, they have to run it. So that means if you build the service, you need to run it. Your team actually is responsible for sorting out the critical bugs. So the team puts all of the necessary monitoring or repair mechanisms that they need. Nobody wants to be up at night and sort the issues. And it should be the team that decides what is important from the technical point. Uh, usually business try to put some decisions uh, from above, but technically they're hiring you as engineers. That means they trust that you know that best. So the, the decisions for, 
for the technical things, it should be on the teams, unless you have, unless you don't trust your teams. But that's not a good place to be in. Uh, what does it give? One team, it's it's better co collaboration, and they have a single target, so they do know where they're moving. They do know why they made some of the uh, s some of the. I lost the word, but uh, it's it's they are moving into the same direction, and they know and they know if they uh, made some compromises now, they know why they made it, and they might be able to fix them later on. Development process, that's an uh, important part from uh, perspective is do you know what you are building? So. In a lot of cases, what I've seen with the waterfall, it's uh, a very typical thing. You want to describe everything up front, uh, if looking from the vendor's perspective, just to be safe. So you know that uh, everything's going to change unless I document it, it's not going to be paid. So I'll just try to put everything in. And building the product is not a like protection game. The, the, the product is, is not... Uh, just to get someone in the legal uh, things. So trying to define everything in the beginning, it's an impossible task. So nobody's going to do it unless you're lying. So uh, if somebody is able to estimate you like two years work, I would definitely think they're lying. I would even say one year is still lie. You always take it. Uh, Usually it's like five minutes to come up with a number. Uh, and uh, if you are trying to get the whole stuff together, it's, uh, it, it, it's difficult to predict what's going to be after two years. So your roadmap is going to be messed up and you'll be basing your decisions on the wrong assumptions. Because you haven't tested it, you don't even know what's going to be in one or two years. And. Uh, Launching it in a big bang, again, is uh, it has a very big price, and uh, it uh, makes you actually to neglect some of the practices, and all of those neglected practices actually gets back to you at the end. So you you might get something like this. So are you building the right thing? This might be someone's fantasy, and it could be correct. So development pro pro process, it needs to be tailored for building the product. So it needs to be, the product is ever kind of continuing thing. So it's ever evolving thing and it needs to change all the time. So currently the Agile became kind of a mainstream of project management. So it's pretty well fit for actually doing the products because you're doing that incrementally, you're launching, you're verifying, you're getting back, fixing, changing your roadmap. So the quicker you launch, the quicker you get the feedback. So that means uh, the quicker you verify that you're actually building the correct thing. So it's not the wrong thing. You can always uh, modify your vector of development and maybe, we, maybe there is a need to switch to kind of more important features. Uh, Additional thing is you can actually adapt to changes, to external changes, business changes. It could be multiple things, and you can choose to build different things, more important things, not waiting for the whole year to launch something and then realize that half of it is just not necessary. And uh, the other part, if you are doing the delivery right, it makes sure that you have it running. So it's always verifying that you are able to deliver. Uh, and it's not going to happen that it's not going to be a big bang or surprise that it's just not, be, not easy to deploy. So just it needs to have a wider view what you're building in the long term and be able to correct everything as it goes incrementally. Architecture. So the... Just to go simply from POC to 
to a product that's going to be live. I've seen that as well multiple times. Most of the projects, products that are running actually came up from the POCs and they still have uh, all of the uh, things inside. So scalability becomes a problem. Usually it's the one thing, one big thing that's just grew, grew, grew naturally and now there is uh, no way to scale it. Uh, the scalability becomes, if you need to scale it, you need to rewrite the whole of it. That means you're dumping everything that you've done before and building it from scratch. Uh, the spider web is, I wouldn't say it's kind of a uh, rare occurrence. Usually all of the software, uh, if you make dependency graphs or anything, you just get like everything is connected with everything. Uh, the performance issues creep up as the user base grows or the business requirements grows, then you start seeing the performance issues. And the problem is that you start fighting those small things all the time and you're just wasting your development efforts just to sort out the things, just move them, maybe fix one thing, then break another thing and just keep running in that loop. Deployments are horror movies. I've seen that. <laughs> Uh, how many actually seen the deployments which take months? So it's, it's really, I don't suggest that for anyone. Uh, and it's kind of tracing or having monitoring in place. It's, it's just like, what health? Usually it's just maintenance 24-7. You have the department for that. So you get something like this. And actually, it's not the broken bridge, it's, it's being built bridge, so it's not finished yet. E, so what does the architecture needs to be? So if looking from the product perspective, you, you, you would get a pretty good overview of what needs to be done. And uh, if you're looking long term and if you have a roadmap, you'll definitely put the things for scalability or feature expansion as required. Uh, this, the scalability in these days should be pretty easy, so you need to choose a correct architecture that, that allows you flexible extension. Uh, it might be small things uh, today, but your user base could be growing pretty fast and you should be able to adjust to that. The other part is it should maintain the flexibility of the product. So while you're developing it, it should be easy to add new features. And I would probably stress remove the features as well. Keep, keep adding features is not, uh, it's not a good thing because it just grows the whole stuff. You should be taking something away as well. Uh, and one of the important thing, it's, it should not lock you into the vendor. Uh, a lot of frameworks, especially if the vendors are selling those, they try to lock you in. So you choose the items, they lock you in, you cannot change it later on. That automatically puts you in a, uh, in a vendor's cadence. So as they evolve their frameworks, you have to go with them. And uh, another part of the architecture, it needs to support the parallel development. So. Uh, if previously the teams were pretty big, so you could have 20, 30, 100 people working on, on a single project. Uh, in this case, it should be possible just smaller teams, but they are self-contained. They are rolling out their changes. They don't interfere with the work of other teams. So your architecture needs to be built in such a way so you can parallelize the work. You might have three, uh, 10 people uh, teams that are working on the same product but are able to do that in their own cadence or in their own speed. That's kind of you get a planned picture. You know what's, what's, being, what's going on, you know what's going to be next and you have, uh, and you have at least preparation for, for ex extension. Development practices. So I think on this front we're at a pretty good position. There are companies that are lagging behind, but uh, most companies that I've seen, they already applying some of the good development practices. So 
what happens if we take that away? Let's say we have every, uh, good processes, good, good uh, development processes, we have product, but then everyone just does in their own style. So it's going to be a messy thing. So it's very, it's very difficult to onboard something new onto, onto those projects. If the code is littered with different patterns, it's very difficult for people to jump in the code and actually switch the context. So we have to learn other patterns just to figure out what's going on. E hack comments, you should be avoiding those or it's going to become a novel and you would see like a code littered with the hacks, to-dos and things like that. Uh, lots of that code, that should be removed, should not be left. Uh, lots of inefficiencies because everyone is doing in their own style, so they come up with their own bicycle. And of course, then spaghetti comes. As you, if you don't understand, you'll just find a way how to do it in the quickest way, and that creates spaghetti. And that's like how many patterns does this house have? <laughs> it doesn't look, I don't know, maybe someone likes it, but. Uh, so what should be built in? So it should be, consistency should be built in into development practices. It should be easy to navigate. If you have a consistency, it's very uh, quick. The developers will very quickly find the pattern and then the navigation becomes a very simple thing. Uh, and one of the things is really important is apply the same quality standards for all code that you write. If you do the, for example, I do the proof of concept, I might skip some rules, I do the product, I, I apply all of them, just apply those practices for all. It's just going to keep you repeating, you'll do it correctly all the time. Those practices does not add time. Actually, they save you time. Uh, keep the coupling low. That will allow actually you to be flexible, change, move, uh, upgrade, and things like that. And think about the security not as an afterthought, but think of it uh, immediately while we're building. It's very difficult to put the security after rather than just thinking up in front. And testability, again, if you have the team built out correctly, that should be built in from the beginning, not figuring out how to test it later. And one of the important things is don't compromise of what is agreed. Usually what happens is the business starts pushing for more features. So it's team's responsibility actually to, to tell the business what they're going to lose, what what issues they're going to run into if they, so they can make a, 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 make a decision kind of correctly with the knowledge that they have. And uh, always, there is no, we'll do it later. Uh, actually, I've never seen that. I've heard that a lot of time, we'll just kind of sort it out later. And it never kind of, it's, it's never later. So you, after putting the, correct practices, it, it would be pretty clear, kind of all of the stuff is uh, nicely, nicely placed, not scattered around, easy to navigate. Deployment practices. So this is a very important thing. It's kind of DevOps thing, uh, but there are a lot of things related with it. If you're doing like a project thing, this is often the neglected thing because everyone thinks it's just going to be launched one time, will fire and forget. and from my experience, manual deployments will fail. It's not where, it's just a question of when. It's not a question whether they're going to fail or not. Uh, multiple environments, people tend also to put a lot of environments there. It does not mean that you're going to have less, less uh, issues if you have more environments to go through. No automation of the deployment, initially it's, uh, it looks pretty simple. When your application just starting at the proof of concept phase, it doesn't have a lot of time, it, it doesn't have a lot of moving parts, uh, a lot of components, so the deployments are pretty easy to do and often neglected. So it's a manual work, yeah, but it's five minutes deployment. The, the more it evolves, the more time it consumes, the more difficult it becomes. And at some point you realize that it's just really 
consumes a huge amount of time for you to just to get your, your product out. No test automation, that's kind of a pretty simple thing. If you don't have test automation, it will clog your deployment pipeline. That means the testers will be looking at the, at the deliveries and you cannot push the new until uh, other one arrives and then there are even more bizarre things is actually when you have at least three deployments ready and then business just decides, oh, I'm, just, I'm not just going to go in sequence. Let, let's push the version C. And no automation means a lot of boring stuff for someone to do. So somebody will have to do that boring manual testing, deployment, and everything that's related with boring. So this is going to be like, this is a one-off thing, I guess. <laughs> I don't know whether they're actually doing that every time. But this is how the manual deployment looks like. Deployment practices, what do they give if we do apply them correctly? Uh, in my opinion, it should be the first thing that actually is being built when you start the project. Put the pipeline. If it's easy, that means it's an easy script, easy setup. Just keep it there and keep rolling. That means after you get it right immediately, you will always have to check it out. And always make sure that your code makes it to production automatically. So there is no manual step. So you can actually push, push the button. Maybe it's a manual step to push the button, but it actually makes it to production. That automatically, me what does this mean? This means that you have to think about your deployment process and verify that it works. So you will not kind of uh, overlook some of the things which might be neglected just because, oh, we, we'll sort it out later. And uh, do not allow exceptions in your process. So do not allow, oh, the unit tests are failing. Let's just switch them off and roll it out. We'll fix them later. So don't allow these things to appear because you would be neglecting the unit test that might be catching some bugs. And that means that you might have to do some work. And that work uh, is not going to go away anyway. So it should be repeatable. It should be tested all the time. It should be running. That, that makes sure that you have a fully functional deployment pipeline. Monitoring. This is a, very often, it's the last thing that the people actually think about it. It's, uh, it's the thing you just give it to the app support. The app support will just solve it somehow. And the clients are not the best alerting system. So if you have production and you actually just react when the clients call that something is not working, uh, it's, it's not the best thing. And no monitoring me means you, you are able just to react. So somebody finds something, you just jump in, and actually you start running around because it needs to be fixed quick. Tracing the issues becomes very time consuming. If you didn't think about the tracing your code or if you are using microservices tracing how the request goes through the whole uh, architecture, it's going to be a nightmare to figure it out in production. And uh, multiple moving components, the, it makes tracing very difficult. So this is what happens. So somebody built, but nobody monitored whether there is anything wrong with it. And this is app support thing, of course. The, the rest of it is OK. Uh, so think about the monitoring. When you're, and this is automatically puts you, if you are in the mode of building product, you will, you will want to know the health of your system. So think about it immediately, put it in, make sure it kind of reports relevant data for you. Uh, and that gives you a consistent view. So it's not just automatic tools that are built in, but you actually have the things that report issues. Uh, monitor and log only rele relevant information. Uh, I've seen things where app support simply says like, are you, are you monitoring, are you logging things? And they say, Yes. Can you show me? Yes. 
and then I can see it's like 10,000 warnings uh, in their log. So what, what's the chance that they're going to look at least of maybe top ones, five or whatever, but definitely not going to go through 10,000 of them. And dashboards should not just be nice pictures. They should be meaningful and they should be showing something useful. So if you're building the dashboard, just make sure that they are required or they are actually bringing the benefit. So you have to know what's going on in your software. And one of the big actually questions, if we go through all of these items, who should be driving? Who should be driving those patterns or who should be driving those practices correctly so that you are able to produce sustainable software? So the easy answer is everyone. It's like everyone should care about this business, the engineers, uh, anyone else. But uh, what I will say is like the engineers are the ones that actually know how it needs to be built. And it needs to come from engineering for the business. Because as much as businesses, they just don't understand the technical thing. They don't... Uh, understand what implications their decisions will make. So it's up to our engineering teams, engineers ourselves, is to be able to explain what choices going to mean in the long run. Is it going to... Because uh, if you tell business that in five years you will have to rewrite all of this uh, software because we're making some compromises right now, I guess you'll definitely get the answer, uh, well, then let's put something in so it's not like after five years. And uh, how to approach that is just start, start small. Just get some, some of the items, present the facts, show what's going on. They understand. They are not stupid people. So again, why do we need the sustainable software? It's... Uh, it's to future-proof our product, so we are able to extend them, create more features. As for us, as for engineers, it's actually to do some sensible stuff, not just to support some legacy systems. We all want to play with the new toys. Uh, and the other part is to have ability to change the business. So this is a very important thing as well. As long as we are able, most of the businesses right now, if we're looking at the information, data, kind of business that are working on the data, the, their flexibility depends on their actual systems that they're running. So if they don't have flexibility in their back end, they will not be able to change the business itself. So there's always going to be some faster business that's going to take its place. And just to repeat, how? Always look at the holistic approach. Always look at all, all of the items. Don't neglect some of the things just because maybe they are hard or not, uh, not in place currently. You need, if you are missing at least one piece, it's going to break the whole stuff. And treat your software as a product, always. Just think, even if it's a product short-lived, you'll always, it will put you in a mindset to, to think a little bit further just to put something in, just making sure the app support is, is happy and things like that. It will kind of make it better automatically. And look at the software in the holistic view. It's kind of from sales to production. So do take uh, the comments from sales, from product owners, from business. Just have a full view what it needs to be done. It, it brings a lot of knowledge how many uh, it's, it's the size of the customers, what do they want, it kind of gives you a holistic view. And uh, communicate with the business all the time. That is, uh, they are hiring you not because they just need engineers, they are hiring you as enablers, technology enablers uh, on the back end. So if they don't trust you, uh, I would suggest to switch the company then. And Let's build sustainable software, not just the plastic stuff. 